the views and opinions in the following program remain those of the producer and in no way reflect the views and opinions of Medford Community Cablevision, its board of directors, management, or other affiliates. Hello, my name is Dr. William Gerard, and welcome to this session of The Doctor Is In. I'm going to be touching on a topic today, actually more than one topic today, uh, as opposed to spending the full hour on one subject. And as I go along, I'll be going off on tangents and trying to um, expand on that uh, idea of more than one topic. Uh, so you'll see some breaks as we go along. The first health issue I'd like to talk about is something, again, that is experienced by most people at some point in their lives. It's, it's important to understand that what I talk about and what I try to get across to you is are conditions that apply to a large, large number, in fact, a majority of, of you. Uh, I don't talk about conditions that are rare. I don't talk about conditions that happen to a small percentage of the population that uh, you as a listener uh, or a potential patient or a, potent, a person with a potential issue uh, that they can't relate to. I uh, want something you can, you can see, that you can understand, um, and you can relate to so that what I talk about isn't something that's great for the schools and great for the universities and teaching, but doesn't have any practical application for the vast majority of you out there who might be uh, suffering from these conditions. So um, you'll always hear me talking about conditions that are, are relatively common, actually very common, and affect all of us at some point or another in our lives. The first condition I'd like to talk about is insomnia, or actually not so much insomnia, just lack of uh, proper sleep. I'll put sleep issues. Okay. Having a problem sleeping, have a, prob a problem staying asleep, getting to sleep, not having a restful night's sleep, not having the, the REM sleep that, that's commonly talked about, which is rapid eye movement where the deepest part of sleep, uh, it, it, which occurs in the middle and later part of the morning. Not having that as part of uh, a nightly routine for our bodies to help heal and recover from the day and to rejuvenate itself. Not having that um, can be very debilitating uh, and very uh, health compromising over the long term. Um, in my opinion, sleep deprivation, lack of good quality sleep, has profound ramifications in every aspect of your life. Uh, it can affect, uh, first of all, your alertness, your mental function, your moods, uh, your personality can be affected, uh, energy levels, performance as at home, as a father, as a mother, as a child, uh, as an adolescent growing up, performance at work, uh, job performance, efficiency of job performance, uh, enjoying the activities, the recreational activities that y you might have that you, you love to do. Um, if all those areas of our lives are compromised and lessened, if there's a problem with uh, sleep and a condition of sleep deprivation. And it's insidious, and by that I mean it's something that's there that it's oftentimes is difficult to pinpoint difficult to put a real precise label on it, saying, I'm not getting enough sleep, I'm tired all the time. Or even if it's acknowledged that it is a problem, the consequences, the negative consequences, can sometimes be just minimized to the point where there's a little bit of denial going on. Um, 
personality changes, being sh uh, terse, being sharp, impatient, um, uh, not being able to listen to your child or to your spouse and, and really have a, 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 a good uh, back and forth relationship because the, the sensory uh, load is just too much. Not having that, and it's easy to slip it under, slip it under the rug and say, yeah, I'm just a little overtired. Um, because it can become a crutch to, to depend on all the time. I'm overtired, I'm overtired, I'm overtired. And there comes a point where the person and the persons on the receiving end are getting a little tired of hearing, you're tired, you're tired. Well, do something about it. What do we need to do to fix it? And it can really be wearing on the people in your life, at work, at home, to the point where it can upset their lives and really upset the flow they're, that they're going through. And it can really lead to a uh, challenge for the relationships that you have, be it personal or business. So even acknowledging the fact that there's a little bit of tiredness, quote unquote tiredness going on, only scratches the surface as to really what problems sleep deprivation and lack of good quality sleep can have in our lives. And once that's realized that it is a lot more profound than one would think, then it becomes something that uh, in, a, in a awareness of the, the major problem that it can be, that something more needs to be done. And that's what I want to talk about today. What, it, what do I do about it? What, what is it to be done? Go to sleep earlier, go to sleep later, uh, do this, don't do that. Those are fine. Those are things that seem to make common sense uh, suggestions to make. But oftentimes there's underlying issues, underlying problems that are not addressed that's leading to the problem with sleep. And I'll be getting to those things. And until you're really made aware of those underlying uh, covert factors that are affecting sleep and quality sleep, then they'll not be addressed. And if they're not addressed and not fixed, then the problem continues and goes on and on and on. So I just want to make more today of an awareness of some of the uh, areas that you might not have thought about that cause sleep problems and uh, lack of good quality sleep. And as I go along and I hit on them, you'll be able to relate more to them and say, you know, assess yourself, say, is this happening, is that happening? Um, and as we go along, I think it'll, it'll hit home a lot more than simply saying, go to bed earlier or go to bed later or change your mattress. Uh, it, it's not that simple. Uh, and it not being that simple uh, can really lead to a lot of frustration and a lot of uh, wondering as to what's really going on, which adds to the problem when this person's tired. Frustration sets in, uh, what do I do? Uh, how do I fix it? Yes, I know there's a problem, but nothing's fixing it, and I, I just don't know what to do, where to turn. And acknowledging that as the fact that, hey, I don't know, is an important step to getting to the real core issue for you yourself. Now, it may vary person to person, since there are a number of reasons why sleep can be interrupted and good quality sleep not obtained. So we have to really understand that each person is individual, and though there may be a, a, a specific number of reasons why these issues happen, uh, we have to figure out what it is for your particular case. As usual, I'll go to the triangle of health, which is physical, chemical, nutrition, and the mind, spirit. Okay. As usual, these are the three areas that need to be evaluated when looking at any particular health issue. Physical, which is I as a chiropractor, treat the physical, I treat the body, make sure there's structural balance that the nervous system is functioning properly. If the nervous system is not functioning properly, disease and imbalance can, can result from that. And lack of quality sleep, insomnia, is one of those uh, problem areas that can crop up if there's a physical imbalance, and I'll show you why. Chemical nutritional. 
chemical could be, again, is anything we eat, anything we drink, anything we take into our bodies, be it over-the-counter medications, be it vitamins, be it the foods that we eat. And that's where nutrition comes in, what type of foods that we eat, uh, what type of food do we not eat. And all those can contribute in, a, in some people uh, to a real significant issue that's causing the sleep problem, the mind and the spirit. I'm sure everyone can relate to this one pretty easily. Ruminations in the mind, something going on in the mind, stress from work, stress from uh, the home, stress from something, and our minds just is not resting, a problem that's not resolved. Uh, there's conflict, a mental conflict, a problem uh, with, with someone in your life, or a conflict, or maybe there's a happy uh, situation with someone in your life, uh, a new friend, a, a new acquaintance, that there's really a lot of fun and, and enjoyment of that. And even that fun and enjoyment can be preoccupied in the mind and say, I can't wait to see that person again, or I can't wait for this again for this situation to happen, or I can't wait for that golf tournament tomorrow because I really want to get out there and play well, or some sporting event that you're looking forward to. And the night before, it's difficult to sleep because you're thinking about that. So it's not all negative that uh, can in interfere with our mind, uh, our stable, uh, controlled, uh, comfortable, at ease mind. Sometimes positive, happy, great things that are happening to us can have uh, that effect as well. So it's, it's not always a negative issue. Um, same thing with the physicals. There are times when physical, uh, we can be in great shape, have a great day, uh, exercise, and, uh, and all that type of thing, but it can come back and, and really bite us in a negative way because there are consequences to that feeling good physical and there are consequences to a physical, an active physical life, and we'll talk about that. So in talking about these three areas, I'll always, uh, in insomnia and sleep problems, I'll be referring to these three areas and getting back to them. First one is the physical. That's always where I start because as a chiropractor, that's uh, most oftentimes uh, what I find as an issue with any health problem that comes into my office. Physical. Physical deals with the body in general and the nervous system in specific. Now you're wondering, how can the physical and the condition of my nervous system and our ligaments and bones and, and muscles and tendons, how can that affect and have a detrimental effect on sleeping and lead to insomnia and sleep problems? Well, here's what happens. Because we're physical beings, we have nerve endings, we have nerves in our body. And if those nerves are calm and peaceful and at an equilibrium, then our minds and our physical body can be calm and not hyper, uh, peaceful, uh, uh, kind of moving along like Old Man River instead of a raging rapids. So if our nervous system is for any reason hyper-functioning, which means higher functioning, or hypo, less functioning, then it can create a sensation in the body that is a pain, a tightness, uh, a lack of uh, smoothness, a lack of ease in our body. We're kind of jittery. Our body is, is, is awake and and, and sort of stimulated from the inside out in a nervous system sort of way. Um, can, imagine that you have some type of pain in your body, a back pain, neck pain, shoulder, your foot hurts, uh, your muscles are just sore and achy, um, which is a common problem with a, phys a, a, a body that's in good physical shape. Someone goes to the gym, works out a lot, can have a great physical being and it's great to exercise and be in shape, but there oftentimes are sore muscles and pain involved with the consequences of that exercise and physical activity. So the nervous system is now functioning at a higher level in this case. There's soreness, there's pain.
now as you're walking around during the day and performing everyday activities, that soreness and pain may not be so evident and it may be not interfering with performance of everyday activities because there's the mind is distracted, the body's distracted. Uh, if I have a sore back or an, an issue with my back that's maybe tight and sore, uh, I can be talking right now and you would never know it and I would never know it because I'm, I'm preoccupied with talking and, and, and giving this show. But doesn't mean my back is still not hurting, for example, or my uh, muscles are still not sore. So there is a distraction that can happen that can override the fact that our bodies are sore and achy or there's a pain or an injury somewhere. But what happens? Now you go to sleep at night. The room is quiet, it's dark, and you're lying there. There's no input, sensory input from the outside. Your mind's not preoccupied by doing something, reading or physical activity or talking with someone. So there's no preoccupation, there's no distraction of the mind off of the pain or the soreness that you're feeling. So take that sore back or sore muscle or sore shoulder and now that becomes a primary concern and primary focus as you're lying there trying to get to sleep. Now as you're trying to do that, it's difficult if not impossible to get comfortable. You're in one position. Okay, that feels good. Then a minute later, five minutes later, that gets uncomfortable because the pain starts returning and the soreness starts coming back. So you toss and turn and kind of maybe loosen up by tossing and turning and you get in another position. Okay, that's comfortable for 5 or 10 or 15 minutes or an hour or for 10 seconds. And then the tightness comes back, the soreness comes back and it's, it's kind of teasing you and tantalizing you to say, oh, I'm not going away, I'm still here. And as much as you want to sleep, I'm not going to let you sleep because I hurt and I'm going to make you feel the pain and the soreness that I'm hurting from and I'm going to interrupt your sleep. So now this becomes an hour, a two hours, all the tossing and turning, all from a simple soreness or a pain condition in the body because the nervous system is hyper-functioning. The nerves are on edge. They're being uh, stimulated. They're raw. They're being overstimulated because of the pain or the soreness that you're feeling. So now all that turning and tossing and turning and tossing, how are you going to sleep? Well, you sleep, you'll catch a few minutes here, you'll catch a few minutes there, but what is, and that's not insomnia, insomnia, insomnia is you can't sleep, but it definitely is a sleep problem because you're not getting a true, deeper, uh, consistently long sleep where the body recuperates and regenerates in ways we don't even know about. There's a reason why we sleep, a reason why we have to sleep, and the reason why we do sleep. And it's the rest, it's the rejuvenation of, of all the systems of the body. And that has to happen by a good, rest, restful, peaceful, uninterrupted sleep. But if the tossing and turning is happening all the time, all night, or a, a significant part of the night, then that sleep depth is not obtained and the rejuvenation and the rest that sleep is intended to provide is simply not there. So eight hours, nine hours, ten hours later, six hours later, you might wake up and gotten glimpses of sleep here and there, but you know full well that you're still sore and achy and that you're not having a restful night's sleep. So you wake up feeling a little bit not quite right yourself. Now for one or two nights, you may have enough reserve that it's not a significant issue. Okay, our bodies are pretty resilient and pretty strong to where one, two, maybe even three or four nights, depending on the person, can deal with it. it. It can recover from that. But you take that soreness and pain and you lengthen it into a week, into two weeks, into two months, into two years, into 20 years. And believe me, I've seen patients who are going through this soreness and pain of such a long-standing duration they have no idea what a full night's sleep is like. They can't remember what a full night's sleep is like. And they're walking around in, in a fog and because of sleep deprivation over a long extended period of time. That's how the physical can affect the body to interrupt the sleep. 
Now, it makes common sense, and you're probably already aware of this. Yeah, I have a bad back. I didn't get to sleep last night. And uh, I may be telling you something you already know. That may be true. And there is, sure, it's common sense. However, what I'm going to present to you is the fix to that. It's one thing to identify a problem. It's, it, it's relatively easy to identify a problem. Giving a proper diagnosis is a little bit more challenging because we're dealing with sickness. That's true. But oftentimes, things, just common sense will win out. And common sense will say, yeah, I'm hurting. I didn't sleep well. And it's because I'm tossing and turning because my back is aching. It may be something so obvious as a back pain. It may be something not as obvious as sore muscles or the body is just wound up with no real pain or soreness. It's just wound up. And that type of inner tension, inner tightness, um, it's difficult to put a finger on and say, yeah, this hurts here and that hurts there. It's not a pain. It's not a soreness issue. It's just a tension issue. Walking around like this, tight, instead of just kind of relaxed and flowing. And it's that inner tension, oftentimes, that is underneath the surface that doesn't show up as a pain or a soreness. And that's the other side of the issue that you might not be aware of is the obvious, sure, backache, neck ache, uh, strain this, strain that. That's pretty obvious. But you take that piece of it away, and what you're left with in, in a lot of people is that inner tension, that inner tightness, because the nervous system is hyper, and there's no obvious pain or symptom associated with it. And a person, you might not know it, because it's been such a gradual, gradual buildup, a gradual onset over the weeks, months, years of this inner tension that it's not obvious that when walking around tight and sore and, and inner, inner inside is all wound up. So you go to sleep and you just can't because you're so wound up. It's just waiting to explode. And that's a, a, a real separate issue that is still going to create a hyper nervous system and lead to sleep problems. So you've got two sides of that physical, the obvious, which is a pain or soreness, and the not so obvious, which is an inner tension, an inner uh, stress that, that build up in the body. And either one of those can give the interruption of sleep, which leads to the sleep problem. What's the fix to it? Well, how do you remove that pain or soreness of the body? One. And the second thing, how does one remove that inner tension and inner tightness that's there when it says, okay, relax, relax, relax. Well, I can't. The person can't because this is, it's inside. It's not something that is, is mind controlled. It, there's, a, there's a physical reason why it is, and that physical reason can't be overcome by simply saying relax. You can't relax piano wire that's strung on a piano. Imagine that piano wire saying, okay, I'm strung out and I'm in the piano, I'm, I'm under a lot of tension, now relax. Uh, that piano wire can't relax. How, do you piano, how do, does it relax? If it wants to, you, you just remove the tension. How do you get rid of the tension in the body? By normalizing the nervous system. How do you get rid of the soreness and pain in the body? By normalizing the nervous system. By normalizing means... I mean, bring it from its hyper state, bring it down to more of a smooth, not high, not low, but in a, in a, a moderate condition, a normal condition, where it's not really hyper or hypo. So how do you do that? That's what chiropractors do. That's what exercise can do, yes. That's what massage can do. But we're talking about the nervous system here. We're not talking about the muscular system. We're not talking about uh, the lymphatic system. We're not talking about the arterial system. We're talking specifically about the nervous system. The nervous system is specifically addressed by chiropractors. That's what we do. We deal with the spine and all the nerves associated with the spine, which is the cable that carries the, the, the spinal cord and all the branches. It carries all the nerves of the body and branches out to all different parts of the body. 
and chiropractors were trained to normalize the nervous system. Bring it from high, bring it to normal. If it's low, bring it up to normal. And that's what we're trained to do. And a good quality chiropractic treatment by a competent chiropractor who addresses the nervous system issue in a comprehensive and a complete way will balance the nervous system and take away the cause of that inner tension, take away the cause of the pain or the soreness that's happening in the body. Now, the other things like a massage or acupuncture, yes, they have their place, but we're not talking about having a place. We're talking about the nervous system, and they can be used as adjuncts or add-ons. That's true, but until the nervous system is addressed and normalized, then they'll have limitations as to how effective they are. They may have a big impact on a person to where the muscles are just so sore and so tight that that's the majority of the problem. Well, fine, a massage would be great for that. Acupuncture, if it's dealing with the meridians, if that's a major reason why a person's having an issue, acupuncture will deal with that well. But from what I see and from what I see in the vast majority of people, it's the nervous system that really holds the key to normalizing everything else. And if the nervous system is not addressed and fixed and normalized, then normalizing the muscle system, normalizing the acupuncture meridian system, normalizing the diet, normalizing the mind, are only going to have a certain percentage of effect because the nervous system is adding and contributing its part to the imbalance that's happening. So the nervous system needs to be balanced and that will get rid of all the tension and tightness and soreness in the body that is causing the physical reason for the cause of the sleep problems and the insomnia. I've had many, many patients come in who have a muscular problem or whatever the pain condition that they're having. And I'll give them a treatment two or a few. And then after a few, they'll come in. You know, the, for after the first treatment I had, I haven't slept that good in years. Well, it's happened enough times that it's going to mean something. And what it means is that they were some suffering from some kind of sleep deprivation, some type of sleep problem. They really didn't acknowledge it in the consultation or as an issue why they came in because they were in such pain. That was the reason why they're in, why they came to my office. But I treated the body, normalized the nervous system, normalized the muscle system because when you normalize the nervous system, the muscles also tend to be in balance with the techniques that I use in my office. So basically, I gave them a complete adjustment and really calmed down the hyper state that their body was in. And the pain that they came in for, fine, that was significantly helped. But what really caught their attention was that the fact that they slept so well and they haven't slept that well in so such a long time. So that was a perfect example of how the nervous system can impact why there's a sleep problem. And for a lot of you out there, I'm sure you can relate to this. Be it a specific pain or a soreness or an injury that you have, or be it an in internal tension that you sense is just not quite right. You know it's there. You just don't know what to do about it. And the what to do about it from a physical point of view is to seek chiropractic care, normalize the nervous system, get rid of the cause of that inner tension or the soreness that you're feeling, and the sleep problem will tend to dissipate and sleep will improve. It has to improve. There are certain laws of nature, and laws of nature are immutable, unchangeable. They, they just are. It's the way things are. And when you start making the body calmer, or bringing it up from a low functioning to a more normal on a physical level, good positive things happen. It, it, it has to, it, it, it's the law of nature. And one of the things that happens is that calmness and sleep improves. Now there may be other reasons that in addition to the physical that's causing the sleep problem, but for right now we're talking about the physical. The next one to talk about is the 
chemical nutrition. chemical nutrition, what we eat and drink, and also what we don't eat and drink. It's fine to know what we do have in our uh, dietary habits and dietary lifestyle, but it's also important to, be, to become more aware and to realize what is missing that's promoting, potentially promoting health and promoting a, a better uh, functioning body, which would eliminate the sleep problem. And chemical nutrition also deals with um, medications, over-the-counter, or prescript. Prescript. Doctor prescription. So it's important to know what medicines are taken and not taken. And medicines, uh, they're there for uh, a reason, and oftentimes there are side effects from them that will contribute to sleep problems. Uh, sometimes they uh, may, you may be taking a medication in order to get to sleep. That has its own set of problems and its own set of concerns. Um, sometimes uh, we might get to a point where whatever it is, sleep, just need to sleep, whether it be a prescription or not, just to get through a short period of time. Those, there's a place for that, and there is a, a reason for that. However, over the longer term, some, the descriptions for, for sleep um, and for uh, sleep problems, um, even in the physician's desk reference, they're indicated for short-term use only. If you really read, read uh, the, the reasons why and the, the length of time these medications are to be given, um, by and large, the vast majority of time is taken for short term only. The problem is that the short term only turns into a little bit longer, a little bit longer, and quite long. And there's a reason why it's only short term. To get over a, a, a hump in the road, a bump in the road, to get over a, a traumatic experience is short term reason. But to lengthen them out has its own set of consequences that are typically negative and there are really no positive co reasons, uh, consequences to them. But the eat and drink part is very important. Um, we all know that sh uh, certain things that are eaten can create a hyperstate, can create a, a, a stimulation. Um, caffeine, sugar, um, even some of the, the, the uh, low calorie sweeteners, the NutraSweet, the, uh, the, the Stevia, the, uh, the other ones. Uh, there's all kinds of artificial and supposedly natural sweeteners out there. And those can have in some susceptible, susceptible individuals consequences that lead to sleep interruption and sleep deprivation and the ability to get into a really good profound sleep or to get to sleep at all or to get to or good restful sleep. So it's important to understand that these chemical nutritional, this chemical nutritional part of the problem needs to be looked at. Um, once the physical is addressed, uh, then you need to look at this. What's, a, what, what's the, the foods that are being eaten? What's the drinks that are being eaten? Is there a lot of cola, a lot of caffeine, a lot of sugar, um, a coffee, tea? some of the, uh, the sport drinks. Um, all these uh, drinks have a lot of caffeine in it. They've got a lot of sugar in it, some of them. And even the natural sweeteners can have a stimulatory effect on the nervous system and can interrupt our, uh, a good healthy sleep. So that needs to be evaluated and looked at as to the presence of and the importance of those uh, foods and drinks whether they're affecting our sleep problems or not. Caffeine, uh, taking a cup of uh, caffeine, be it coffee or tea, or some of the sport drinks, or even taking caffeine pills. 
When caffeine gets in the body, it stays there for a long time. The half-life for caffeine, meaning if you take, let's say, 100 milligrams of caffeine from whatever source, uh, the half-life is usually around six hours. So after six hours, then half of that caffeine is gone. Then another six hours, another half is gone. So after 12 hours, you still got a little bit of caffeine circulating inside the body. And in susceptible individuals, people who are sensitive to that, caffeine is going to interrupt getting to sleep, it's going to interrupt staying asleep, and it's going to interrupt a good, solid, profound, deep night's sleep. So caffeine always needs to be evaluated and looked at. And you have to really venture back into the day as to when the last caffeine was taken. And because it does have a, a, a long presence in the life before it's detoxified by the body and totally gotten rid of. So you need to eva evaluate that. Uh, certain foods, are stimula stimulatory foods, sugared foods, um, some of the artificial sweetener foods, um, which are really prevalent in, our, in, in, in the diet nowadays. Um, those types of foods, again, can stimulate the body to the point where if you have them at too close a time to when you go to bed or when you try to get some sleep, it can have that effect of really getting the sleep, yes, but it may wake you up because it drops the blood sugar and it creates a whole other uh, areas of problems. It can stimulate, yes, and prevent sleep, but also remember with sugar, you get a high sugar rush, but it drops down to a low blood sugar. And low blood sugar, in this case, can lead to a wake up at two or three in the morning. You ever wake up in the morning and you're hungry? Or you wake up and you feel like you're wide awake? Or wake up and feel like you're very thirsty? Oftentimes, it's because the blood sugar has dropped to such a low point that it says, the body says, I need sugar in my blood. My blood sugar's dropped. I need to eat something to get the blood sugar up, or I need to drink something to get the blood sugar up. Because low blood sugar has its own set of side effects, its own set of effects. Low blood sugar, hypoglycemia, can lead to irritability, can lead to shakes, sweating, diabetic shock. Di what's, what is diabetic shock? Diabetic shock is the person who takes insulin, takes too much insulin, or the reaction to the insulin they take is too strong, and the blood sugar goes from being real high, which is why the person is taking the insulin, goes down to normal, but it keeps dropping. And they go into hypoglycemic shock. What is that? Blood sugar is very, very, very low. And in the extreme case, a person in diabetic shock is on the ground, quivering, fainting, passing out, cold sweat, uh, shaking. That's a, a real extreme example of diabetic shock, but it's an extreme example of low blood sugar. That's what diabetic shock is. So you take that extreme example of, of, of a life-threatening condition and you make it not so extreme. You make it to where there's a little bit of low blood sugar, but it still can give sort of the same type of symptom irritability, uh, awakeness, uh, lack, lack of ability to, to relax, um, uh, hunger, thirst. Uh, how can the person sleep if their low blood sugar is low and they're about to go into a hypoglycemic condition? It's very difficult to. In fact, it's impossible because the body's going to wake itself up. Body's saying, I need, I need to get my blood sugar up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. So wake up. Blood sugar is low, get up, have something to eat, go back to bed, feel a little better. So what's my point in all this? My point is eat and drink nutrition affecting the, blood, affecting the sleep habits and affecting the quality of sleep. What was eaten, what was drunk, what was not eaten, what was not drunk in the hours the day before over a long period of time creates that low blood sugar effect creates that stimulation of the body effect that interrupts sleep. And I just gave you a perfect example of how a low blood sugar situation can wake you up at night and keep you up and interrupt sleep. Now I wake up in the morning and sleep has been interrupted. Again, get away with it once or twice or three times. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a long period of time. 
a month, a year, 10 years, all of your adult life, who knows? But there's all kinds of time frames for every person out there with this type of problem that's being caused by a chemical nutritional imbalance because of what's eaten and what's being drunk. Meds have their application here too, but we're talking about what's, what's uh, our diets and what our food eating patterns are like. Okay. Um, again, common sense. Um, have something that's, low, uh, that's uh, neutral as far as food. Stay away from caffeine. Stay away from uh, the stimulatory foods. Stay away from the stimulating drinks. All those are common sense things that you've heard again and again on uh, the TV as far as a 10 minute uh, splurge on how to help a person get a better night's sleep. And those, are, those have a place and that's some of what I'm talking about. But I'm also talking about the other side of it which is a longer term, which is a low hypoglycemic state, a low blood sugar state that is caused by eating and drinking the foods that contribute to that type of state. And it's not something that's fixed once. It's not something you change your, your eating habits a day, a week, or two. If the condition of poor sleep is enough of a problem with you that's being contributed to and caused by chemical and nutritional, then it's going to take more than a week. It's going to take more than two weeks for that to be fixed. So after a week, you'd make the diet changes. If you don't see anything happening too much, then it could be you need a little bit more stronger approach. And the stronger approach I'll get to in a minute. But still, the basic idea, the basic concept, the basic principle we're talking about is eating and drinking foods that don't stimulate and don't lead to that hyper condition or don't lead to a low blood sugar hypoglycemic state. Meds have all kinds of side effects. There may be a medication for uh, something that's a condition that has nothing to do with, with sleep, has nothing to do with, um, in, in you would think, or anything to do with sleep, or you wouldn't think make the connection to sleep. But medications can be, especially if there's more than one medication taking, can really create issues when they're combined together. And you have a witch's brew when you have medications, two, three, four medications, five, six medications I've seen in my office of uh, uh, combinations of medications that once you put them together, it becomes a, a, a brew that you have no idea what the, the interplay, what the interaction is between the medications once they're all put in the body at the same time. So it's important to understand and to know that. And as a chiropractor, it's not my place to say come off meds or to, to stop them, that's, that's not what I'm saying. My saying is look at it, evaluate it, talk with your medical doctor that you got the meds from and, and talk to them, was, could possibly this be interrupting my sleep and cr contributing to things that's uh, giving me a sleep problem. So, so becoming aware, becoming uh, aware of a potential problem in the med area I is really what I'm talking about here. These other things can be addressed and can be done by you or with a little bit of guidance from uh, someone who knows what they're doing and can give some consultation and some advice as to what foods, what foods not to eat and what foods and drink not uh, needs to be included. There may be a point where the nutrition has been going on for so long that there's a significant nutritional imbalance in the body. The B vitamins, the minerals are just so depleted. It's like a dry sponge. It's a dry sponge sitting on a counter. It's, it's hard, it's crusty, there's nothing in it. Pour a little bit of water on it. Make believe the water is, is vitamin, our vitamins and minerals, which our body needs. Common sense. Vitamins and minerals are there for our body because our body needs them to function properly. If you take away those vitamins and minerals over a long period of time and you make a depletion and you make a deficiency of them over a long period of time, what does common sense say? Common sense says there's going to be a problem. Where that problem shows up, who knows? It's based on our biochemical individuality, and it differs person to person. But in this case, we're talking about 
balancing the body from a sleep problem point of view. So you take a nutritional deficiency that's been there for a long time because maybe the diet hasn't been that great, maybe there's been an illness, maybe there's been a stress over a long period of time, who knows. But the fact is there's a nutritional deficiency uh, from the vitamin and mineral point of view that will not be fixed if it's long enough in duration, will not be fixed by simply eating more vegetables, eating more fruits, eating more protein, and staying away from the junk type foods. It's not going to happen because there are certain conditions and certain time frames we're dealing with. The longer a, th a situation is there, the longer it's been there, the more the body needs from a healing point of view. And at times, there are going to be times when simply dietary changes are not enough because the nutrient deficiency has been there for such a long period of time. The organs and glands and, and uh, uh, hormonal system has been so depleted over such a long period of time, it needs sort of intensive care. It needs that type of thing. Is it a scratch on a, on a door that can be touched up with a little paint? Or, or is it t 20 years of rust on the whole door and undercarriage that needs to be done more aggressively? And there's all, that's, uh, there's all kinds of variations. So if that nutritional deficiency has been there for such a long period of time and diet isn't going to fix it, what's going to fix it? You need vitamin supplementation, mineral supplementation, herbs have their place because herbs or uh, specifically have a curative and a, a fixative effect on the different glandular systems of the body. If certain glands and organ functions are so depleted that they're not functioning well or they're functioning hyper, then herb preparations, the right ones, can have a very normalizing effect. And herbs have been around for, for thousands of years and used for thousands of years, and they have a, a, a very healing effect on the body and can speed up any recovery and speed it up to the point where it can get as close to normal as, as possible in that person. Vitamin and minerals the same way. So you take that dry sponge which is an extreme example, but it's still a good example. Take that dry sponge that's sitting on the counter. You pour uh, a teaspoon of water into it. It's gonna, the water is going to disappear in that sponge, and you're not even going to notice that it had any effect on the dry sponge. It's only a teaspoon. So you put maybe uh, 10 tablespoons, and the sponge is still real dry. You don't see any noticeable change. See, that's what we're talking about here. A dry sponge is, could be some of your body just so, so wanting nutrients that it, it soaks it up, uses it, and it's as if nothing happened because the need is so much greater than what's being given by the food. So that's where you need to say, all right, instead of a, a teaspoon or instead of 10 tablespoons, I'm going to get a quart of water and pour it on that sponge. So you start pouring that quart of water on the sponge. You get through a third of it, a half of it. Sponge starting to come to life. You get into three quarters of that quart gone, and suddenly the sponge starts oozing out water. What you've done is you've saturated the sponge, saturated your body with the nutrients from that quart of water, and that quart represents supplementation, vitamin, mineral, and herbal supplementation. Why? Because it's what's needed. The sponge was so depleted, so dry, that a teaspoon wasn't going to work. Ten tablespoons wasn't going to work, which is what foods can do. But you needed something a lot more dramatic, a lot more intense. You needed therapy of the vitamin and mineral supplementation. And that's what that quart of water represents. So now you've poured that quart of water onto the sponge, now the sponge is saturated. Not only is it saturated, it's, it's dripping water. All you've done is you've taken all the nutrients that are needed in the supplementation form and you've saturated the sponge so that now the body's getting rid of what it doesn't need. There's no detrimental effect to taking a few more milligrams of B vitamins than is needed because the body says, oh, I don't need it. I'll just get rid of it. No need to, to, to be concerned about that. But in that saturation point, you get a little spillage, that's fine. 
but it's not so much the saturation that we're concerned about, it's the depletion. So how do you know how dry your sponge is until you saturate the system to where you've now got a body that's really functioning as much as it can and as good as it can with all the nutrients that it needs? So that's how vitamin mineral supplementation and herbal supplementation plays a role in balancing the chemical and nutritional needs that will not be done strictly by changing the diet. And um, the vast majority of people who are having a sleep deprivation problem or a sleep issue, they've not had it for a week, they've not had it for a month, they might not, most likely have not had it for a year. They've had it for a longer period of time. And if that long period of time has gotten to the point where it's such an issue that their sponge is pretty dry, and they're going to need some intervention in order to do that. Now, we talked about the physical. goes a long way to doing that. Now we're talking about the chemical nutrition that can support the physical and add to the benefits of the physical in order to help resolve the sleep issue. So now you see how the chemical nutritional can have an impact on sleep and how simply changing the diet might not have the effect you th might, that you're looking for. If that's the case, then either what you're doing is not really what is needed to be done you need some outside consultation to have an objective third party looking at what is being changed. And once that's done, then you can get on the road to, to sleeping better and being better. Or your needs are beyond what simply changing the diet and eating some healthy foods is about. And you get into the dry sponge issue. The other thing to consider is making changes, adding things that are more positive for health and more uh, health giving, but still having the other parts that are not so health giving. Changing a better diet, all this, but if there's still a lot of coffee, a lot of sugar being eaten, a lot of caffeine being taken in, it can be really a, 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 a tough situation to correct by changing the positive if there's still a lot of negative to negate the positive changes. So you have to be honest and realistic with it to yourself. And doing it on your own is a very difficult thing to do. It's a challenge. It, it's, 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 and in the ultimate end stage of, of results, it might not be so worthwhile doing to get the best result. Try it. Do the best you can. If it's not working, then it's time to seek some outside help. Give it a shot. Give it the best you have. Be honest with yourself. And, and if it's not working, be honest with yourself for that too. Okay, the other thing is the mind and spirit. Oh, by the way, not all vitamins and minerals are created the same. Um, that's a whole that's a whole nother show. Uh, I could talk an hour on and I probably will next time or the time after about vitamin mineral supplementation and herbal supplementation. Um, it's not it's not as if going to CVS or going to GNC or going to uh, a health food store and getting something off the shelf. It's not that easy. Um, buyer beware. The problem with vitamin mineral supplementation is that not all vitamin and minerals are created the same. And there are strengths and there are weaknesses based on all the formulas and all the different combinations of vitamin supplementation that, can be, that are out there uh, available to use. And unless you know what you're doing, unless you have a, a, a knowledge about nutrition, it's basically what I see all the time. People going up and looking at this big wall of vitamin minerals, and I can see them reading. And the expression on their faces, what am I looking for and what am I reading? And do I really know what I'm reading? Do I really know what I'm looking for? And you can see that confusion all over the face. 
And you've probably, many of you have had that same confusion. You go to the store with great intention, and you look at all the stuff out there, and it's like, oh, boy. The selection is overwhelming, and you have no clue, no clue as to where to begin, where to start. You ask the clerk. They'll lead you somewhat into the right area, but there's other things. The quality control, the supplementation, the, uh, the nutrient density. There's a lot of other factors that that clerk has no influence on and no, nothing to say about and it deals with this specific vitamin and mineral supplement. So my point is, is not all vitamin supplements are the same. And unless you know what you're doing and know what is going on with the form and the potency of these supplements, then uh, there the is really a lot to be lost and a lot of money to be lost. And not only that, a lot of ineffectual supplements to be taken. And that's important to consider when you start dealing with the nutritional part of the problem that we're talking about. The mind and the spirit. Lying asleep at night, mulling over things, positive, negative. It's just something on the mind. It's just not resting, tossing and turning. Um, sometimes happens to all of us. You think of something and it gets you started and you can feel your heart beating and your, your body's waking up. It's like, oh, why did I think of that? It's such a negative thing or a positive thing. Or why am I thinking of that? It's, it's almost as if you're up doing laps. Your body's being stimulated by what's going on in the mind. And that's where stress comes in and that's where all these other factors of our lives come in. Um, that can be a difficult thing to, to deal with and a challenge to deal with. Um, and how does one deal with it? Mind control, trying to get de-stressed, trying to uh, think positive, healthy thoughts. Those are all cliches. They have their place, but it's, it's a lot more than that. Um, there are certain parts of our lives that give us mental stress, and those need to be looked at and evaluated. And if I saw a patient with a sleep issue that they wanted to have treated and came in as a primary issue or even secondary, then I would ask them about the stresses in their lives. And... I wouldn't do so much as try to psychologically analyze and deal with these stresses. I would just try to make the person aware of them and make the person aware of all these things that are going on. And by doing an awareness point of view, that can help. But I find that this part of the triangle is of minimal importance when, as far as numbers when dealing with people and their lives uh, being affected by poor sleep. This doesn't have as much of an impact. And also, remember, these go each way. Nutrition chemical can affect the mind. The physical can affect the mind. So it's important to know, is my mind and my stimulation of the mind or can't stresses in the mind, whatever stress it is, is it being affected by a low blood sugar, by a body that's not healthy? Is it being affected by an ache or a pain that's not letting me sleep and I'm just mulling it over and that's going over my head and thinking about what have I got as a condition that's not getting better and then the concern and worry. You see how it can gather, gather energy and gather momentum? When it wasn't so much the mind-spirit issue, it was a physical or a chemical imbalance that led to the mind mulling over these issues. So when you think about that, and that I find is the vast majority of how the mind and spirit enter, in, enters into a, th this area of sleep problems. It's not so much a primary issue, primary concern, as it is a secondary caused by these other two areas. And these, again, are fixable. And this I see in my office all the time. And it's amazing. You fix these two, the mind-spirit calms down. It gets more soothing. It gets more, more balanced. It, uh, it has the mind it becomes happier, becomes less critical, becomes less stressed. Um, the personality changes. All these positive effects happen in the mind and spirit simply because you've changed these two areas. That's it for today. I'm out of time. If you have any questions uh, about this topic I've talked about today, then feel free to call me in my office, and I'll do my best to help you or steer you in the right direction. So thank you for tuning in, 
and I'll see you next time. Take care. Father.